Hello, I'm Megan Rosenblum. I'm a librarian living in Los Angeles, but I'm originally from the Philadelphia area. One of the hardest parts about leaving Philadelphia was stopping being a docent at the Rosenbeck. I, along with the Mütter Museum, it's one of my favorite places on earth, and James Joyce's Ulysses is my favorite book. Uh, I'm reading from chapter 16, Eumaeus, in which we find our pal Stephen Dedalus a little worse for the wear. Some scholars say this passage is Joyce intentionally writing badly. So let's just agree that any poor reading that I do of it is also intentional. Preparatory to anything else, Mr. Bloom brushed off the greater bulk of the shavings and handed Stephen the hat and ash plant and bucked him up generally in orthodox Samaritan fashion, which he very badly needed. His, Stephen's mind, was not exactly what you would call wandering, but a bit unsteady, and on his expressed desire for some beverage to drink, Mr. Bloom, in view of the hour it was, and there being no pump of bar tree water available for their ablutions, let alone drinking purposes, hit upon an expedient by suggesting, off the reel, the propriety of the cabman's shelter, as it was called, hardly a stone's throw away near Butt Bridge, where they might hit upon some drinkables in the shape of a milk and soda or a mineral. But how to get there was the rub. For the nonce, he was rather nonplussed, but inasmuch as the duty plainly devolved upon him to take some measures on the subject, he pondered suitable ways and means during which Stephen repeatedly yawned. So far as he could see, he was rather pale in the face, so that it occurred to him as highly advisable to get a conveyance of some description, which would answer in their then condition, both of them being ED'd, particularly Stephen, always assuming that there was such a thing to be found. Accordingly, after such preliminaries as brushing, in spite of his having forgotten to take up his rather soap suddy curt handkerchief, after it had done yeoman service in the shaving line, they both walked together along Beaver Street, or more properly, Lane, as far as the farriers, in the distinctly fetid atmosphere of the livery stables at the corner of Montgomery Street, where they made tracks to the left, from thence debouching into Amiens Street, round by the corner of Dan Bergen's. But as he confidently anticipated, there was not a sign of a Jehu plying for hire anywhere to be seen except a four-wheeler, probably engaged by some fellows inside on the spree, outside the North Star Hotel. And there was no symptom of its budging a quarter of an inch, when Mr. Bloom, who was anything but a professional whistler, endeavored to hail it by emitting a kind of whistle, holding his arms arched over his head twice. This was a quandary, but bringing common sense to bear on it, evidently there was nothing for it but put a good face on the matter and foot it, which they accordingly did. So, beveling around by mullets and the signal house, which they shortly reached, they proceeded perforce in the direction of Amiens Street Rail Railway Terminus. Mr. Bloom, being handicapped by the circumstance that one of the back buttons of his trousers had, to bury the time-honored adage, gone the way of all buttons, though, Entering thoroughly into the spirit of the thing, he heroically made light of the mischance. So, as neither of them were particularly pressed for time, as it happened, and the temperature refreshing, since it cleared up after the recent visitation of Jupiter Pluvius, they dandered along past by where the empty vehicle was waiting without a fare or a jarvey. As it so happened, a Dublin United Tramways Company's sand strewer happened to be returning, and the elder man recounted to his companion, apropos of the incident, his own truly miraculous escape of some little while back. They passed the main entrance of the Great Northern Railway Station, the starting point for Belfast, where of course all traffic was suspended at that late hour, and passing the back door of the morgue, a not very enticing locality, not to say gruesome to a degree, more especially at night, ultimately gained the Dock Tavern and in due course turned into Store Street, famous for its C-Division police station. Between this point and the high, at present unlit, warehouses of Beresford Place, Stephen thought to think of Ibsen, associated with Baird's the stonecutters in his mind somehow in Talbot's place. First 
turning on the right, while the other, who was acting as his fetus Akates, inhaled with internal satisfaction the smell of James Rourke's city bakery. Situated quite close to where they were, the very palpable odor indeed of our daily bread, of all commodities of the public, the primary and most indispensable. Bread, the staff of life, earn your bread. Oh, tell me, where is fancy bread? At Rourke's the baker's, it is said. En route to his taciturn and not to put too fine a point on it, not yet perfectly sober companion, Mr. Bloom, who at all events was in complete possession of his faculties, never more so, in fact, disgustingly sober, spoke a word of caution re the dangers of night town, women of ill fame and swell mobsmen, which, barely permissible once in a while, though not as a habitual practice, was of the nature of a regular death trap for young fellows of his age, particularly if they had acquired drinking habits. Under the influence of liquor, unless you knew a little jujitsu for every contingency, as even a fellow on the broad of his back could administer a nasty kick if you didn't look out. Highly providential was the appearance on the scene of Corny Kelleher, where, when Stephen was blissfully unconscious. But for that man in the gap turning up at the 11th hour, the finest might have been that he might have been a candidate for the accident ward, or failing that, the Bridewell, and an appearance in the court next day before Mr. Tobias. Or he being the solicitor, rather, Old Wall, he meant to say, or Mahoney. Which simply spelt ruin for a chap when it got rooted about. The reason he mentioned the fact was that a lot of those policemen who whom he cordially disliked, were admittedly unscrupulous in the service of the crown. And, as Mr. Bloom put it, recalling a case or two in the A Division of, in Clan Brassel Street, prepared to swear a hole through a 10-gallon pot, never on the spot when wanted, but in quiet parts of the city, Pembroke Road, for example, the guardians of the law were well in evidence the obvious reason being that they were paid to protect the upper classes. Another thing he commented on was equipping soldiers with firearms or sidearms of any description, liable to go off at any time, which was tantamount to inciting them against civilians, should by any chance they fall out over anything. You frittered away your time, he very sensibly maintained, and health and also character besides, which, the squander mania of the thing, fast women of the demi-mold ran away with a lot of pounds, shillings, pence into the bargain. And the greatest danger of all was who you got drunk with, though. Touching the much vexed question of stimulants, he relished a glass of choice old wine, in season, as both nourishing and blood-making and possessing a prurient virtues notably a good burgundy, which he was a staunch believer in, still never beyond a certain point, where he invariably drew the line, as it simply led to trouble all around, to say nothing of your being at the tender mercy of others, practically. Most of all, he commented adversely on the desertion of Stephen by all his pub-hunting pub confreres but one, a most glaring piece of ratting on the part of his brother medicos under all the cirques. And that one was Judas, Stephen said, who up to then had said nothing whatsoever of any kind. Discussing these and kindred topics, they made a beeline across the back of the custom house and passed under the loop line bridge where a brazier of coke burning in the front of a sentry box or something like one attracted their rather lagging footsteps. Stephen, of his own accord, stopped for no special reason to look at the heap of barren cobblestones, and by the light emanating from the brazier, he could just make out the darker figure of the corporation watchman inside the gloom of the sentry box. He began to remember that this had happened, or had been mentioned as having had happened before, but it cost him no small effort before he remembered that he recognized in the sentry a quantum friend of his father's, Gumley. To avoid a meeting, he drew nearer to the pillars of the railway bridge. Someone saluted you, Mr. Bloom said. The figure of middle height on the prowl, evidently under the arches, saluted again, 
calling. Night. Happy Bloomsday from the Rosenbeck.